Hey, Bankless Nation, welcome to a special episode series we're doing called The Road to Permissionless because, David, we are on the road to DeFi's largest conference ever. This is the Permissionless Conference. It is happening May 17th to 19th. So this is an episode where we hype some of the companies and projects that are coming with us to Permissionless. They are on the road right now. David, there's some really great speakers coming to Permissionless. Uh, if folks, if you don't have your tickets, this is what you're missing out on. Uh, tell them some of the speakers that are attending, some of the content that's in store. So me and Ryan will be having a fireside chat with Chris Dixon himself. Uh, but of course, it does not does not stop there. Jiho from Axie for all you Axie players as well. Cooper Turley, the music NFT lord of, of LA, as well as Jai from Rari, Stani from Ave, Vance Spencer from Frameworks, uh, Kevin Owaki from Gitcoin, uh, and of course, some Ethereum core developers like Preston Van Loon. Uh, and then we are on the hunt for some secret unreleased guests as well. Uh, and so guys, it's going to be just a reunion, I think, of the Bankless podcast, of all your favorite episodes anyways, as well as some alternative layer ones for those that swing that way. And some metaverse, NFT artists, people pleaser will be there. Um, and just a, the full gamut, the full spectrum of the entire crypto industry will have some sort of representation at Permissionless. I, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for people to meet other Bankless listeners too, right? Our community mm -hmm. spread sure. out all over the globe. So uh, a lot of Bankless listeners will be attending this and, and you can too. Of course, Bankless premium members get a 30% discount on a big. permissionless ticket which is big, big money now uh mm -hmm. ticket prices go up every two weeks i think they're close to, to capping out but a 30 percent discount will save you hundreds of dollars if you want to go check that out we'll include a link in the show notes and so today david on the road to permissionless we have mark richardson who is the head of research at bancor which is like a, an og protocol that, that I think a lot of people have heard of, but probably want to understand a bit further. So we talk about that. We also talk about what he uh, wants to achieve at Permissionless, what some of the opportunities might be, uh, job opportunities, that sort of thing. And he gives some fantastic advice near the end on for first time conference goers, I was taking notes of. I like it. it turns out, David, you can get your full ROI on a conference ticket just by snatching free hoodies. At the yeah. swag stores, huh? <laughs> so uh, that's that's something cool to, to tune in for as well. Yeah, I remember uh, grabbing a, a bunch of swag in ETH Denver 2018. That swag turned into like OG swag. Uh, really? And so like it's swag, crypto conference Real swag, it, age, it ages like fine wine, right? Like over the years, <laughs> it starts to turn into the OG swag. Uh, so you got you got to get your get your swag early because you know in, in a few years there won't be any more swag like that. All right, guys, we are going to get to the conversation with Mark Richardson, the head of research at Bancor. So let's get to it. Hey guys, uh, this is the Road to Permissionless. We are here with Mark Richardson. He is the head of research at Bancor. Mark, how you doing? I'm doing so well, Ryan. How are you doing? Uh, doing great. Really excited about the conference that's coming up, and of course that that is a theme we will get to. I want to hear about your thoughts in the conference, what you're trying to get out of it. But first, you know, it'd be really helpful for I think Bankless listeners is some background on Bancor. Yeah. So Bancor is like a an OG DeFi <laughs> protocol. You guys are like one of the originals. If not the uh, original. But, uh, yeah. It's like yeah. So so slightly before. Tell us about Bancor. Yeah. G give us the TLDR. Yeah, absolutely. So even, um, you know, even before Ethereum, um, you know, Bancor was still a project. So it was a, uh, actually a community currency project. So the, uh, our, uh, first, uh, chief economist was Bernard Lita. Um, and so he's better known for being the inventor of the Euro. Um, and so he joined, uh, Bancor and, uh, was investigating the, the use of community currencies with us. And so these were sort of small semi-contained projects, um, some places in Africa, um, a handful of places in, in North America. Um, they were really looking at the, you know, the way currency is used and whether or not you can uh, have a system that isn't contingent on government issued fiat. And it turns out that it, it is possible. Um, in fact, it works quite well. But the problem is, is that every time that one of these uh, contained economies has to interface with another economy, um, suddenly the community currency becomes well, I don't want to say worthless, but it becomes difficult to value, right? Or at least no one can agree on its value. So every time that you need to sort of pay for babysitting or something like that, or someone to cut your hair or, um, you know, basically sort of labor swap sort of things, community currencies work very well. But as soon as you sort of plugged into the global supply chain, they stop working, right? So it, 
you can't pay for gasoline, for example, with a community currency or um, for produce from a farm or something like that. And so what we realized was that the problem is exchange, right? You need to find some way to interpret the value of, of a currency versus another currency. Um, and that uh, led to the creation of um, the, the first automatic market maker concept. And this is what Bancor took to its ICO. Um, and, you know, I think we raised something like a 165 million in, in two hours. Uh, it's kind of a special uh, ICO because we actually s deliberately stopped the raise, right? So the, it could have kept going, but after a certain period, after you've raised a certain amount, it doesn't make sense to, to keep collecting that capital. So we actually stopped the, the raise prematurely. Um, I think for the time, it was the, the world record holder for, um, for the, the, the ICO fundraising um, component. Um, and so the whole idea behind that ICO was to construct a, um, a, a market maker that used um, smart contract logic rather than human intervention um, to automatically uh, allow for different uh, cryptocurrencies to, to be valued against each other. And so really, you know, the community currency component of Bancor came first, and then the cryptocurrency component of Bancor was, was born of that, which is interesting. Um, so Bancor was um, yeah, deployed on Ethereum just slightly before Maker was, right? So it's actually, uh, you know, the, the, you kind of still call it the first DeFi protocol. I think Ether Delta was, you could say, is probably technically first. Um, but yeah, you know, it was right up there. Um, and so the, um, at, at that time, Bancor was still considered a, an exchange, right? There, there was nothing special about it. DeFi didn't have a name yet. Um, things like permissionlessness and, and trustlessness weren't really a part of the narrative um, in, in the, a big way yet. Um, and so, you know, all of our uh, legal advice was to, to regulate and manage Bancor exactly the same way that you would any other exchange. So all of the laws that applied to Binance and Coinbase and, and everyone else um, also applied to Bancor. Um, if you wanted to start a liquidity pool, we would send you the forms, <laughs> right? Which I know sounds ridiculous today, but that's exactly how it was done. Um, and it meant that the user experience was, was pretty terrible, um, but you know, it worked. Um, it, I think the first liquidity pair there was um, Gnosis versus BNT, and there were a couple after that, a couple of others after that. Things like Power Ledger, I think was one of the first ones. Arcona was one of the first. Um, and you know, it, was, it was working, it was still, you know, it demonstrated the principle, but I, I don't think that it really um, tapped into that kind of culture of, of Web3 in any significant way. So it was, it was I, maybe we can, looking back on it now, it was a very elegant um, demonstration, right? Proof of principle rather than an actual functioning product. Um, and so the, uh, there are a couple of criticisms against it. One was that the, um, you know, for, for something with this kind of utility, um, why not use ETH, right? As the, um, as the base currency instead of your own token. Um, and so the, the, the Ethereum Foundation and Vitalik Buterin were, were um, you know, motivated um, to create a, uh, a grant program, uh, which was f to create a Bancor-like, um, you know, a, a Bancor-like protocol um, and uh, use ETH essentially as, a, as the base asset instead of BNT. And that's where Uniswap was born from. And so Uniswap obviously borrowed uh, a lot of those principles from Bancor. Um, it, it simplified uh, some of those materials and, and it massively improved the user experience. And so after we saw what Uniswap did, and I would say that their biggest innovation was ignoring regulators, right? They, they said you can have pools, right? It can be user-owned pools. They also started telling people that you can earn fees, which is something that our, um, our attorneys at the time said you absolutely can never say. And so it kind of set this precedent, right, for, for DeFi that we can actually start talking about these things. And I, I think that we have to respect Uniswap for having the backbone to do it and kind of tra trailblazing that path through the regulation, not necessarily through the technology. Um, and so after that, we, we launched uh, version two of Bankwell, which is actually the first concentrated liquidity AMM. Um, and so we, it was actually, it worked very, very similar to Uniswap V3. Um, except that it would automatically keep your liquidity in range constantly. So we, we used a, a chain link price oracle that would um, basically bend the curve such that it always behaved um, like, it was, um, like it was in range. Um, it would use a, a 20x amplification factor, quite similar to Curve V2, actually. And what's, in, what's amazing about this is this is eight months before uh, Uniswap V3, um, almost um, 14 months before Curve V2. Um, and it worked extremely well, right? We had a, all the volume in the world. We only had like two pools in it. Um, Chainlink was one of them. 
um, and it was you know massively performant on that KPI, but unfortunately it just doesn't make money, right? And I think that the whole industry is waking up to that with regards to concentrated liquidity today. Um, and so the we abandoned that model that was version two, and then we launched version two point one. And so version 2.1 was really trying to focus on some of the more user-facing uh, issues of, of interacting with AMMs. One is the requirement to, um, to provide liquidity with more than one asset. And so we, we invented single-sided liquidity provision, um, which means that you, if you only want to provide liquidity with you know, a certain token or with a handful of tokens in whatever ratio you want, um, Bancor will let you do it. Whereas most AMMs at the time would only accept, um, you know, two tokens or you know a, a prescribed basket of tokens in a fixed ratio, and so we thought that that was unacceptable, and we wanted to come up with an alternative to that. Um, and then the other thing that we wanted to address was um, impermanent loss. So we think that it is um, concerning um, that so many protocols um, in DeFi sort of let the user's choice kind of be upon them, you know. They, they don't do much to educate them about the financial risks of the, the actions that they're taking. And then kind of, you know, um, are, are a little bit cavalier, I, would, I, I think is the word I want to use, um, with the, the funds once they're on the protocol. And so at Bangor, we're trying to sort of push against that a little bit and say that the protocol is responsible for the user's uh, welfare. And so we've invented something called impermanent loss, which is a type of insurance policy that says that um, whatever the uh, whatever the, the, the valuation is of your portfolio um, at the time that you provided it, um, in the token that you provided it, that at the end of your liquidity providing campaign, it should be worth at least that amount. And you should have the, the exact same price exposure to the asset that you have provided. So if you provide 100 link tokens, for example, at the end of your liquidity providing um, journey, when you withdraw, the minimum value should be 100 link. Right in, in whatever um, you know, it, whatever its USD valuation is at that time, um, and so this is actually pretty uh, pretty sophisticated. Um, it was a big part of our version two point one, uh, but version two point one was still an experiment. Right, we, there there was no impermanent loss insurance um, before Bancor version two point one, and we needed to really give it some some air. Right, we needed to give it some room to run, see how it performs. And so over the course of about you know uh, fourteen months, we we uh, were, were very uh, conscientiously studying uh, what was happening um, and were improving um, the theory a little bit. And then all of that went into um, the design of Bancor version three, um, which offers that same impermanent loss protection, but now um, at an accelerated rate and has also lifted things like the caps on the pools. So in version 2.1, um, as an insurance protocol, um, you have to be careful about how much TVL you have, right? Because this means that your liability is increasing. But for version three, um, we figured out a way that we can um, technically tolerate, um, uh, you know, infinite amounts of, of TVL and, and not be any worse for wear with regards to the protocol's liability. Um, so yeah, the Bancor version three is, is very, very, um, you know, it's a very, very significant um, step in, in the right direction. And I think that, you know, that there are other features and things that I think we'll save for, for the other part of the conversation. That's basically how we ended up where we are. Uh, that that was quite thorough. So we've went through like the genesis of this thing through version one, through through version two, uh, into version into version three. And I think we want to talk more about version three. But I have just a quick quick question for you, Mark. So when people interact with uh, Bancor today, and maybe bankless bankless listeners will want to know the answer to this, are they generally interacting with kind of like some Bancor front end, or are they primarily uh, interacting through liquidity through you know aggregators, the matches of the world, and and the one inches? Yeah. How are how are users uh, getting access to these trading pairs and liquidity of Bancor? Yeah. So for to be a liquidity provider, um, I, I'm not aware of any sort of liquidity aggregator yet, but there will be some. Um, I'm absolutely certain of it. I've, I've met um, a couple of teams at, at East Denver that are building these things. Um, but for now, um, you need to, if you want to be a liquidity provider on Bancor, you, you interact directly with Bancor's front end, and that's app.bancor.network. Um, but if you are a trader, um, then you know, Bancor is already plugged into um, the, you know, the, the DEX aggregator space. So if you're using one inch, if you're using Matcha, um, then you, know, you're, uh, you, you can easily get routed um, through Bancor and, and trades you know, often will. So it's very it's very likely that listeners who've used some of these aggregator services have already interacted with with Bancor then without kind of knowing it because uh, yeah. Bancor is sort of you know deeper in the protocol stack and in the in the back end. Yeah, and so yeah, and um, I think 
you know, if, if um, th th there are a couple of really sort of popular assets, things like WNXM, um, basic attention token, Chainlink. Um, so I think, um, you know, Bancor has, I think, 85% of the, the Chainlink liquidity on Ethereum. Um, and we've got, uh, I think, slightly more than that in things like basic attention token. You know, there, there are some, uh, some communities that have sort of gravitated towards Bancor in a very profound way. And so if you've ever performed one of those swaps by one inch or another aggregator, the chances are that it's gone through the bank pools. Mark, you uh, mentioned a, a few things that like uh, differentiated you from, from Uniswap. And I, I think that's an interesting thread to, to tug on. Can you talk about, from what I'm gathering, can you talk about um, just like the philosophical um, uh, structure of, of Bancor. It seems like you guys have a, a specific mm -hmm. uh, beliefs or philosophy about how you guys build yeah. Bancor. Can you just il illuminate that for the listeners? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I'm so glad you asked that, actually. So I, I, I do, you know, I, I think, you know, Bankless is kind of a, a high IQ, um, you know, listenership. Um, and I, I do recommend that reading some of, um, you know, Bernard Leader's uh, books. Um, but essentially, you know, if I, if I have to sum it up, I think that um, if you imagine that, okay, for, first of all, accept that the financial system is invented, right? It, it's not like a, a, a physical law of the universe or something like that, right? It, it's something that has, has come from us and we, we control it. Um, but it kind of also controls us, right? It, like it's, it's kind of um, like we, we, uh, we discover it and invent it at the same time. But there's still an infinite um, spectrum of possible financial models. Right. And we, we're used to the, um, the dichotomy, right? Things like, you know, socialism slash communism versus capitalism. But actually, that, that's a false dichotomy, that there is a, a literally infinite um, spectrum of, of possible ways that you can set this up. And so imagine for a second, like, what is the possibility or the probability that out, just out of random chance through the, the course of human history, that we've landed on like the ideal, right? Or the optimum way to organize the world economy or even not even, not even optimum, but even good, right? That the chances are pretty slim. And, you know, this is one of the things that the Bernard leader would write about is that there, you know, people think that there has to be only one kind of financial system. Um, and it's, it's one of the biggest farces in, in economics, right? There, there are so many different ways that, to do things. And this is why the um, the community currency um, stuff was, was such an important experiment for, for Bancor and for him in the, in the beginning. Um, and so I think that that's kind of where we start to diverge a little bit um, from, from protocols like um, Uniswap um, philosophically, is that we are trying to build something brand new, right? We actually do believe in new economic, um, you know, new financial products, but also new economic theory. Um, and we are, you know, sincerely trying to develop something that hasn't existed before. Um, whereas I think a, a lot of our competitors are trying to recreate traditional finance on a blockchain. And that there are, um, you know, several ways that I, I, I think um, I can justify, um, you know, the, the, the way I'm thinking here. Um, for example, um, I, I still think that Uniswap, like Uniswap V3 is, is an amazing product. Um, but it's still, in my view, sort of something like a, a limit order protocol. It's highly imaginative and extremely clever, um, but it really is kind of a, a set your set your price kind of um, thing and, and wait for the, the order to be consumed. Um, and then we've also seen sort of these developing narratives around um, you know this encroaching influence of, of traditional finance and, and private market makers trying to you know carve out a, a little piece of, of, of land for themselves on blockchains. Um, we know that. Um, you know, the, the, the winter mutes of the world um, interact with um, the, the DEX protocols in a, in a very profound way. Um, and I, I would stipulate that um, there are some of these uh, traditional financial firms um, that are, you know, already building products to try and, you know, uh, have uh, to maintain that power, I would say, in the developing e uh, DeFi uh, uh, sphere. Um, and one of the things that I've seen developed there is basically the, the complete recreation of exactly the type of order book systems and centralized market making systems um, using, you know, more um, slightly more sophisticated uh, blockchain products. So I think they're calling these like the um, centralized limit order book things, right? CLOBs. Um, and what's interesting is that once you let the once you bring that uh, thought process to its logical conclusion, you realize you don't need a blockchain at all. Right. These these things already exist perfectly well in uh, the systems that they're already implemented on. And once they come to blockchains, 
um, you, there will be no difference between using, you know, interacting with something like Ethereum or Avalanche and then just using, you know, Coinbase over the internet, except that one of them, you know, charges you prohibitive gas fees and has, you know, MEV running, you know, MEV issues and other things. Um, and I do think that it's perverse, right? I, I don't think that, um, you know, that they weren't invited. This is kind of a private party. You know, DeFi is still a, um, a, a protest, I, I'd say, against kind of centralized control. Um, and I, I, I think that a lot of these narratives are sort of designed to distract the industry, um, you know, from the, the stuff that we were actually building, right? From the, um, the, the, you know, the, the idea that we can do something that's never been seen before. And yeah, I think that Bancor is very much still committed to that idea that we can do something, you know, important, right? We can, we can do something like, um, you know, valuable, not just financial. Um, and I, I, I think that we're not alone, right? There are a lot of DeFi protocols that I think feel the same way as us. Um, but I don't, I don't know if Uniswap is among them. I think Uniswap is very sort of a, a, a TradFi sort of leaning um, influence it, with, with regards to its thinking. But I can't put words in their mouth, right? I, I can't speak for, for Hayden or for Dan Robinson or for anyone else. Um, it, this is just my, my speculation. But I, I, I honestly think that if they were on this call, they might agree with me. Right, that they do see blockchains as being a, a logical extension of the traditional financial system. I, I, I can't know, but I, I, I have a feeling that that's the case. Well, I didn't expect this to get so deep and philosophical, but this is definitely the stuff that I get really, really interested about. Uh, so that, that was like zooming out and uh, about like the, the ethos of Bancor. I, I want to zoom back in and talk about one particular example, one use case that this uh, ethos might be expressed, uh, which is what you said about um, uh, impermanent loss. Mm -hmm. uh, can you actually explain how uh, Bancor protects its liquidity providers from impermanent loss? What is that mechanism? How does that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So the um, the Bancor network uses BNT as the the universal numeric, right? So all of the assets on Bancor are paired with BNT, and because of that, you know the price of every asset versus BNT, and therefore you know the price of every asset versus every other asset, right? It's the the common denominator. Um, and so the um, when you provide uh, liquidity in a single-sided fashion on Bancor, um, the protocol actually will mint and provide um, BNT alongside you. And so this is the how we power the um, you know the single-sided liquidity paradigm. Um, but it's also what makes Bancor so capital efficient, right? Because um, you know imagine you're a new token project and you want to you know create a million-dollar pool or something like that. Um, if it's you know if it's new, you might have to sell off something like five hundred thousand dollars worth of your token, which in the beginning might not be what you want to do um, for another token, and then provide both of them. Whereas on Bancor, you can just provide you know the entire stack, whatever you want to be liquid, right from the from the first instant. Um, and okay, when the when the Bancor protocol provides that BNT on the other side, that means that it owns fifty percent of the capital. And so you kind of enter into a business agreement with the with the the Bancor protocol and with BNT holders, and that's that the um, that half of all of the uh, swap fees um, are going to be taken in BNT, and this is in a way it's just a consequence of of what's happening, right? So so David, if if you and I were going to start a pool anyway, right? Maybe you've got some USDC and I've got some ETH. Um, and we say uh, you know we'll put in half each, right, into whatever you know into whatever uh, liquidity pool we want. It makes sense that whatever the revenues are, we should split 50-50. And so what's interesting in the, in the bank cost cases is it just happens to be that, that, that you, know, one of your, um, you know, one of your business partners is uh, just a, a, an impassionate you know, protocol, a, a smart contract, but it does earn fees. Um, and as it, as it earns fees, right, it doesn't do anything with them, right? It, it's not going to sell them. It's not going to, um, you know, withdraw them or anything like that. And so what there, there is is this kind of equilibrium where as the um, as trading volume, um, you know, it accrues across the protocol, the, the Bancor system itself essentially sort of vacuums in BNT slowly from the secondary markets, right? And it accumulates kind of sticks to the pool um, in the form of the swap fee. And so let's let's call that K1, right? Rate in, the rate out um, is uh, price related. And so you know, Bancor is a, a a volatile token, just like the rest of cryptocurrency. And so there's this constant sort of breathing in and out of the the BNT uh, token from the pools, right? If if BNT is performing well that week, then a little bit of the BNT will trickle out of the pools and end up on the secondary markets. 
um, and if BNT is going down, then it actually vacuums your BNT at an increased rate, right? Because this is the way automatic market makers function. Um, so there's um, whatever that rate is, right? So if BNT is performing well, then it, it increases the rate out, call that K1. Um, and then if it's not if it's um, not performing well, then it increases the rate in, right? We'll call that um, K2. The other kind of rate in um, is from what we call the, the bank or vortex. And so um, this is essentially a, a kind of economic cleanup process where, um, you know, uh, as um, it's probably too much detail for this conversation. We'll have it another time. But essentially, it means that um, the, the Bancor protocol has access to discounted BNT um, through, um, you know, uh, buying into a, a type of debt market that's in, in internal to Bancor, uh, where people basically sell their, um, their right to withdraw um, or take a loan against it. And the Bancor protocol will then buy that back at a discount. So for most of um, version 2.1's history, uh, we've been um, collecting um, what's called a, the, a you know a network fee similar to, to sushi or something like that but it's not rent rent extracting um, it's used to um, to essentially purchase a um, an insurance policy right so the, the bank of protocol has a way um, to offset the the inflationary risk that it uh, that it has when when users are uh, receiving insurance payouts um, and so as long as these rates oh sorry and then the, the most important one of course is that uh, when you are withdrawing, um, if there is insufficient tokens um, in the in the protocol um, to refund you the, your entire um, you know allocation in the token that you wanted, then the bankroll protocol will mint additional BNT and give that BNT back to you. So it's an insurance payout in the truest sense, right? Um, you know, if you have an insurance policy on your car, for example, and you you know if you write it off. Um, the insurance company generally doesn't give you another car. They give you the cash for that car, right? So it's the same thing on Bancor, right? If, if you provided 100 ETH um, and then you go to withdraw and because of price action, you only withdraw 99 ETH, right? Then the Bancor protocol will re refund you whatever that last ETH is in BNT using its own, um, using its own pool as a price oracle to, to determine how much BNT that is, plus whatever fees um, should have accrued on that position during that time. Um, and in a way, this is extremely, um, you know, th this is easy for Bancor to, to, to do. And it's also, um, you know, easy for the, the user to use because BNT is one of the most liquid um, ERC-20 assets on Ethereum, right? The 80, 80 to 90% of the supply at any time um, is inside the liquidity pools. And so even if you get something like a million dollar payout to drop in the ocean, right, the, the Bancor protocol can, um, can easily swap that without impacting the price at all. Um, so yeah, that's the, the uh, that's kind of the, the components of it. So just wrapping that up, right? Trying to summarize it. Um, all users on Bancor do pay uh, a premium. It's 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 equal to uh, at the moment it's equal to fifteen percent of swap revenue. Um, but it, it's you know when we introduced it, we we're saying that we're going to target twenty percent um, over the period of, of uh, I think eighteen months. And so we're, we're that's soon going to go up to twenty percent and stay there. And so that's an, an insurance premium that helps to cover the, the liability of the protocol and introduces a, a counteracting deflationary measure on top of the inflation that the, the Bancor um, protocol experiences as a result of, of insurance payouts. Mark, I think it's just really obvious how much thought and care has gone into uh, de uh, designing the, the Bancor protocol and, and definitely with uh, protecting users as um, as a, as a top priority. So that's very, very admirable inside of an ecosystem that sometimes kind of forgets that whole side of the, side of the equation. Uh, what other aspects of the uh, Bancor 3, the newest version of Bancor, really excites you? What, 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 what should listeners know about that we haven't covered yet? And, and by the way, Mark, as you're getting to that, just to quick, give us a quick refresh on when Bancor 3 actually arrives. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we, so we, you know what software development is like. <laughs> uh, we, we generally try to stay away from uh, hard deadlines. Um, but, you know, we, uh, as we get closer to, to launch, we, we are trying to give the community um, sort of a, um, you know, a, a rough idea of, of when to expect these things. Um, so we said that, uh, so we actually, we opened up the code this week uh, for the first time. So we, we had a public, a private GitHub that we were using to, um, to build everything um, so that we didn't, you know, sacrifice any competitive advantages during the development period. Um, we've just recently opened that up. So if anyone wants to actually inspect the Bancor 3 uh, source code, you, you can now. Um, we were, uh, were aiming to get the uh, uh, an incentivized beta test out this week. Um, it's probably going to happen this weekend, honestly. 
Um, and so that will be limited pools, um, so only a, a small number of assets and um, fixed uh, TVLs while we run the a uh, million dollar bug bounty on the system to you know to try and, and stress it as much as possible. I'm expecting that the um, the full launch will actually probably happen um, the the week that I'm in uh, permissionless, <laughs> and this was a, this is a total accident, um, but it just so happened to to, to go that way. Um, honestly, we, we wanted to get it out earlier, but we've been um, you know. We, we don't uh, compromise on security ever. And so if something's not ready or if the order does ask for more time, we always give it to them. And so that's kind of um, what the, the process has been so far. Um, but we've just finished our first audit with Peck Shield. Um, and we've got a uh, our second audit with um, Open Zeppelin um, is currently underway. Um, and so by the time that it rolls out, we're hoping it will be a, you know, a completely bug bounded, um, twice uh, audited and um, you know, a fully open source system. So that's that's when it's coming. Probably, yeah, probably beginning of May uh, is is my expectation. So yeah, some of the, the, the there are so many features in Vancouver version three, and I don't want to spend uh, sort of too much time speaking about all of them. But if I if I had to choose um, just a handful, um, I think that the the one that I would um, the one that I would focus on is the the new fungibility and composability of the system. So on version two point one, and I'm sure that you guys will you know appreciate the reason for this. Um, all of the user positions were completely non-fungible. Um, in fact, we didn't we didn't issue users pool tokens at all. They 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 were still there, but they were um, immediately staked in an insurance contract with a timestamp and some price information. And that's you know the protocol needs that um, for calculating the uh, the users' impermanent loss at the time that they withdraw. And so you know I think often when people talk about impermanent loss, they treat it as if it's something that the whole pool has or that the whole system has. They don't realize that it's specific to the time and price that, that you provided liquidity to a pool. And so every single user has their own unique impermanent loss. And this is a, a huge you know, um, gas overhead, let's say. And it's made version 2.1 very expensive to interact with. So for version 3, we've actually um, we figured out a way to make that composable and fungible. Um, and that means that the, the the gas overhead is, is going to come down a, a lot. It's going to make it a lot easier for um, you know, for, for users who aren't high net worth individuals to interact with the protocol. But it also means that we open the door to some really other interesting use cases. Um, so just for example, just yesterday, I was talking with the, the link pool team, um, if you guys know who they are. Um, and, you know, one of the, uh, you know, and they're a phenomenal project. Um, and in a way, um, they're kind of suffering from um, the, uh, the success and popularity of their token. So, um, you know, it, 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 the LPL token has been so popular um, and its use case so, so attractive that now something like 98 supply of the token is, is staked on their own protocol. And that means that there's only 2% left um, in circulation for, for price discovery. And that kind of illiquidity can cause huge problems. It hasn't for them, right? They, they're generally, uh, it's, I would say the protocol is very healthy overall. Um, but it, you know, if, if it does want to grow or if it does want to um, you know, start catering to, to new audiences, it really can't. And so with Bancor's single-sided staking paradigm um, and impermanent loss protection, we are discussing the idea of um, instead of using LPL itself, using BN LPL. So get users to stake LPL single-sided on Bancor and receive the, the single-sided pool token. And because it's insured from impermanent loss, and because it still has that proof of ownership of the tokens that it represents, it's actually just as um, just as attractive um, to ask users to stake that pool token because it's still um, you know it, its price is is 100% correlated to the underlying asset, but actually uh, just a little bit better than that because of the the fee accumulation. And so you can use BNLPL for the intrinsic use case that LPL was built for. Um, rather than the LPL token itself, which means you're no longer competing um, for uh, liquidity and you know and, and staking use cases. And there are a handful of other projects that that I've um, had this conversation with. So SNX, for example, is one of the really interesting ones. Um, it, instead of using SNX to mint um, synthetic assets, using BN SNX to, to mint assets is is um, super interesting. Um, and so yeah, I, I think that the, that pool token technology, the idea of having something that is protected from impermanent loss, already liquid, um, and you know, composable with whatever protocol that you have, um, is, is you know, uh, going to be a major theme of, of the coming year. Um, because I think that, that over the, the, the last you know, uh, bull season, um, 
ignoring you know the the importance of liquidity has been to a project's you know detriment and so yeah we're, we're hoping to help the the industry with that problem you know mark i almost hate to ask this question because i know you guys are heads down on uh, version three but can we even look to future versions beyond version three yeah. so like what does a version four look like what does the three to five year roadmap for Bancor look like yeah so what so what's interesting is that so when i um when I started designing version three, um, it was actually, a, it's a much, much larger product than what we've released, right? Or that what's being planned to be, be, be released. And so, you know, uh, we've decided to, you know, it, it would have been um, so stressful, right? For the, for the community um, to have waited all of those years while we just build that single, you know, that single product and just release all of the features at once. And so we've instead committed to sort of a tiered release schedule. So Bancor version three is actually going to be released in three phases. And so all of the, all of the features that you've heard about in our, you know, marketing materials, um, that's all coming in May, right? That this is all part of the Bancor three phase one release, which we call Dawn. Um, but there are two more phases after that, right? There's phase two, which I think is called sunrise and then phase three, which we're calling daylight. Um, and really most of the features that we that are, that we've described, um, are all things that you get sort of for free with the new organization of the smart contract system. Um, so things that, that I haven't spoken about, right? Things like auto compounding rewards and gasless reward systems, um, you know, things like um, single token, uh, you know, single hot trades, um, you know, uh, things like instant and permanent loss protection rather than vested and permanent loss protection. Th these are all features that you get just from having uh, a system that is built, you know, from scratch for this purpose rather than trying to you know, uh, create a smart contract layer over the top of the old uh, version one system to give it this feature, Bancor version three is designed from the ground up for these new things, right? There, there isn't a single line of code in version three that was in either of our previous versions. Um, so the, um, yeah, the, the, the things that, that we're all looking forward to, the things that we've been public about is just the, 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 first, um, the first wave of features. Um, so the, over the course of the next couple of years, we're going to be committed to both the, the phase two and phase three releases. Um, and this is going to, I think, you know, continue to, um, you know, continue to demonstrate just how sincere we are about that, that mission statement that I, that I said earlier in the, in the call, that you can do something brand new, right? That you don't have to just recreate traditional finance, but you can do something that no one's seen before. This is a really cool time, Mark, to, uh, to I think, have the permissionless conference as well, because here you guys are at the dawn yeah, of exactly. Bancor V3, and uh, that could happen very well the week that, that permissionless is going on, yeah. which is uh, exciting, I think, for everyone else. You're probably like shaking your head and being like, oh, that's, that's slightly terrifying because I mean, it's <laughs> you get a conference at a major release date. <laughs> but, um, can, can, can you tell us uh, about permissionless? So what are you most excited Mm -hmm. uh, for at permissionless, what are you what are you planning to do? What sort of folks are you looking to meet, and who are you looking out for? Yeah, so I think you know, the, the, there's always kind of the the conference business as usual, right? So I'm always interested in meeting, um, you know, other developers and other community members, and just kind of um, you know, especially people that I've spoken to either on podcasts or over Twitter or something that I haven't met in real life. It's always so cool to kind of meet them in person. I'm, I'm sure you guys get that as well. Um, but yeah, specifically for permissionless, because it's so close to our um, version three release and because of sort of the nature of permissionless, right? Like you know, I, I did Decentral Miami, for example, in November of last year. And there's a type of conversation that's appropriate for a conference like that. You know, it was very NFT leaning. Um, it was very sort of AP. I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to think of the, the right, um, you know, the right time. DGEN? Yeah, DGEN, right. Um, and then, you know, there are other conferences where you want to have a much more serious discussion. Um, and then there are some conferences in the middle, right? So things like, um, like the, I just did the Avalanche Summit um, and, and, and Seller. And so there it's like, you know, the, the, people are mostly like super interested in their own blockchain, right? And, and you know, what that means. And, and so having a, a discussion about DeFi in a general sense, um, you know, it, it's not always the best audience to engage with. But I think for permissionless, the, the type of audience that you get there, right? And the kind of people that are listening, um, you know, it, 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 it changes your delivery, right? It, 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 it's a much better opportunity than if you want to say something meaningful, 
um, and have people, you know, respond and, and criticize you, right? It's not just about pontificating from, you know, as if from the pulpit or something. It's about, you know, starting a discussion and, you know, um, if, if people disagree with you, I, I want them to approach me and, and discuss it. Um, but I think that that's the kind of thing that I'm looking forward to with permission, permissionless, right? People that are really thinking about the future of the industry. What, what does it need? Um, and, you know, how do we get there? And, you know, us challenging each other on, on some of the, the preconceived notions that we have, some of the assumptions about what it means to be DeFi or what it means to be a successful protocol. Um, so I'd say more than anything, that that's what I'm looking forward to at Permissionless because you don't really get it, I, I think, at any other conference. Mark, generally everyone is hiring in this industry. Are you guys hiring over at, at Bancor? And for people that are going to Permissionless, uh, who, who, what kind of talent are you looking to meet? And also what kind of uh, like BD relationships are you looking to establish there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, yeah, be, because of the, the composability of Bancor version three, um, we're, all, we're, we're actually looking to, um, to talk to people that want to build on the system, want to build with the system. Um, and, you know, we can, we can support in, in so many ways there. So it's not just a, you know, here's the, the Bank of Three rulebook and, and, you know, off you go. Um, we, we really want to sort of, um, you know, uh, hold, hold the other developers hand through the learning process a little bit, educate them on the system. Um, you know, we, we can share some um, simulation tools and other things that, that would help, um, you know, other projects learn it. But basically anyone um, who is launching a new token project uh, anyone who has an existing token project and has worried about their liquidity problems, has worried about the, um, let's say, the, the expense and unreliability of things like liquidity mining programs. Um, you know, if any of these things have bothered you before, um, come and talk to us because we think we do have a, you know, a, a fairly um, you know, robust solution to, to the problem of on-chain liquidity for, for the long tail of tokens. Um, so that, that's kind of the BD relationship I'm looking to, um, to, to develop. But it's not, it's not it's specifically teams with tokens that, they, that need liquidity. Um, but even you know, if you've got um, an interesting idea, right? If, if there's something that um, maybe your protocol um, uses, um, uses liquidity in, in uh, an unusual way, um, if you've got some other, um, you know, some other process that you want to discuss, I'm, I'm also interested to develop those BD relationships. Um, so with regards to um, with regards to talent, uh, we're always seeking um, you know solidity developers, um, and you know we're we're pretty um, you know we're pretty selective, and you know that is sort of represented in um, our uh, remuneration packages. Um, and so you know if you are a, a, if you think if you consider yourself a solidity star, and you're friendly, right? We, there are people that we refuse to work with. Um, despite the, the how um, talented that they are, um, but yeah, if you're a good fit for the team and, and um, you think that Bancor is an interesting product, then there's absolutely no reason that you should have um, any doubt that, that we would hire you. Um, so yeah, uh, the other thing we're looking for, like we're always looking for things like full stack, um, back end stuff, um, front end developers, um, and of course, um, you know, I'm building out my research team. Um, so, you know, it, it started out pretty small. I now have um, about four people, um, you know, helping me develop the, the new back or economic theory. Um, and if, if that's interesting to you, right, if you are maybe a, a student um, or, you know, a scholar of economics, and if you're familiar with Bernard Leiter and the, the kind of, that kind of concept of like um, alternative, um, you know, economic models, I'm very, very interested to chat with you, um, especially if you're a, a, you know, a strong writer. Right. Um, th th there's a lot of research papers to be written over the coming years, um, and we, we, you know, I, I have a, a plan to target a, a pretty aggressive, um, you know, publication policy. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll see if that happens. But if that describes you, you don't need, necessarily need to have blockchain experience. You don't need to be a solidity de developer to understand what we're trying to do. Um, and you know, if, if that appeals uh, academically to um, to your background, then I'm, I'm equally interested to chat with you. There's something very refreshing about protocols hiring economists. That that seems <laughs> that seems something that's perhaps lacking in this space. We've always uh, done it. Also, I can def yeah, and I can always plus one to if you have the ability to write, the world is your oyster, especially in this industry. Yeah. Uh, Mark, you you seem like a, a a conference veteran. For people that have not yet been to crypto conferences or just really haven't experienced what a large conference like Permissionless might be, what advice do you have for for the conference newcomers? Yeah, don't be shocked when you get there on the day and there's a line that's four and a half hours long. 
Um, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> when, uh, so, I mean, I, I haven't done permissionless yet. Um, but so far, you know, um, the, like, ETH, did, were you guys at ETH Denver? I was, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, so I think that they, they got something like, you know, 5X or 6X, the, the attendance levels that they were expecting. Um, and so, you know, there were a lot of complaints that day about sort of being forced to stand out in the snow and, uh, you know, wait to get, get, get admission and that kind of thing. Um, and it kind of felt like a once off. Um, but then of course, AVAX was also completely inundated with, um, you know, with demand. Um, and I, I'm expecting that, you know, there's kind of a trend here, right? Um, I, I, I think that conference, um, attendeeship or even people just trying to get in, right. Even if they don't have, um, a pass, um, is skyrocketing, right? It, it's basically tracking with the popularity of DeFi in general, which makes sense. Um, but that's it. After that, um, your expectations basically can't be high enough. Um, if you're, um, I would say if you're going to these conferences, you definitely want to spend time at the booths, right? So the, I, I would say that um, it might be a rookie mistake to think that you, know, you have to be at every seminar, right? Or that, you know, if there's, um, you know, uh, or that you should spend your majority of your time at seminars. Um, I'd say that that's the, the, the absolute opposite of what you should be doing. Um, there's probably like one or two talks, like maybe from people that you've heard speak before or that you agree with or you think are interesting, or um, for a, a topic that, that is new to you and you would like to learn more about, that kind of thing. Um, but if you're spending all of your time, um, you know, sitting and, and staring at the stage, um, you know, it's, it, it's going to tune out. That's just going to feel like sort of a nine to five at university or something like that. Um, so I would definitely say choose like one, one or two talks. Um, and let them be the talks that you're excited for. And then you want to spend the majority of your time in the booths, right? Talking to, like actually talking to people and asking them about their projects and sort of grilling them a little bit, right? Like, you know, why is your protocol necessary? What does it do? Why, um, you know, why, why are you doing this? What are your plans? Um, you know, how big is the team? Are you worried about such and such? Um, you know, what's going to happen when, you know, whatever this thing's happening or like, how do you feel about regulation, all of these kinds of things. It's a really great time to, to get into those questions. Um, and you'll be amazed at how much more, um, you know, how much more transparent and forthcoming people can be um, in person when they're not, you know, answering for, uh, you know, an attack on or a perceived attack on or over Twitter or something like that. So the quality of the, of the conversations that you're having um, in person at a conference, I say are much, much higher than anything that you've ever experienced. And I think that, um, yeah, that's, that's the advice that I can give you. Um, and also bring a backpack for all of the swag, right? It's like, a, you know, you, you want to make sure that you collect as many t-shirts as possible. Don't be shy. You know, the people brought that merchandise to spread it out. Um, there's often tables with like piles and piles of hoodies and stuff with no one taking them because everyone's being too polite. Don't be that guy. Just take the hoodie. Uh, that's what it's there for. <laughs> I can definitely plus one basically all of that advice uh go only pay attention to the talks pay attention to the calendars mark the uh mark the talks that you want to go to but the uh but then go to the booths because i remember my first conference in east denver 2018 i still have friends that i made while while talking to people at those booths uh so mark you and i are definitely aligned with how to do conferences mark thank you so much for for coming on to uh this road to permissionless show and and, uh, giving us the good gospel of of bancor and i'm really excited to see v3 uh bancor 3 get out the door uh and for the listeners who are want to go and do a deep dive in bancor there are a couple guides a couple links that we're going to put in the show notes there's a a complete guide to bancor 3 v3 as well as uh the uh the various uh uh, other aspects of the uh, the Bankless blog, uh, Bancorp blog, uh, that we'll link in the show notes as well, as well as the, uh, the uh, Nate, uh, Nathan uh, Twitter thread about this. So uh, once again, Mark, thank you for coming on this Road to Permissionless episode. My pleasure, David and Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.